Going up that river was like traveling back to the earliest beginnings of the world, when vegetation rioted on the earth and the big trees were kings. An empty stream, a great silence, an impenetrable forest. The air was warm, thick, sluggish. There was no joy in the brilliance of sunshine. When prize-winning author Joseph Conrad wrote his novella Heart of Darkness, a journey into the terrifying depths of man's soul, he turned to the cruelest place on earth for inspiration, the Congo. It wasn't the Congo's inhabitants that made it that way. It was a ruthless succession of outsiders, beginning with Leopold II, a Belgian king with a lust for wealth and a passion for murder. Leopold was a very frustrated man as the king of a small country. And he had the conviction that to be worth anything in the world, a country had to have colonies. And he was a very single-minded man about that. King Leopold ascended the Belgian throne in 1865. Nine years later, an American explorer and journalist captivated the world with his stories of peril and pursuit in the farthest reaches of Africa. His name was Henry Morton Stanley. Stanley had discovered this area, which was the Congo, essentially, and he came back to Europe with the tales of what he'd seen there, the riches, the natural abundance, the, uh, the ivory, the rubber, the gum, the palms, the trees, the timber, and this got someone very excited. It basically excited King Leopold of Belgium, and he thought, that's what I want. Leopold was eager for his own piece of the African pie, which was being sliced up into colonies by other European powers. But he had no idea where to start. So in 1878, Leopold turned to Stanley, hoping the experienced explorer could help him take over the Congo. He did. One year later, Stanley was back in Africa as King Leopold's agent. He approached the Congo's tribal chiefs with land treaties and tricked over 500 of them into signing. Obviously, they couldn't read, they didn't know what it meant, and they sold their birthrights for a few beads. It basically meant that they were handing over the rights to their land and the rights to trade, and they were handing that control over to King Leopold. Because what was extraordinary about the Congo was that it wasn't, at the beginning, a Belgian colony. It was essentially personal property of King Leopold II. While Stanley was in Africa, gobbling up a region 80 times the size of Belgium, Leopold was back in Brussels, figuring out how to make his gamble pay off. In 1879, Leopold created a private company whose stated mission was to free the Congolese people from foreign oppressors, namely Arab slave traders who were kidnapping native villagers and selling them into slavery abroad. Leopold assured the world his regime, which he called the Congo Free State, would bring prosperity and fair trade to the Congo. This, he said publicly, was the humanitarian thing to do, but his true goals were far different. Well, he didn't believe in free trade. Um, he didn't care at all for the indigenous population. He had absolutely no humanitarian ideals whatsoever. His aim was to create a colony for Belgium and, and make money. In 1887, a discovery made half a world away would be Leopold's lucky break. Scotsman John Dunlop developed a useful and inexpensive way to revolutionize travel, rubber tires. The Congo was one of only a handful of places in the world where rubber grew wild, and Leopold acted quickly to exploit it. He formed the Force Publique, an army of Belgians and Africans, and got them to force Congolese natives into rubber harvesting. It was dangerous work and required scaling the tops of trees where the valuable vines hung. Leopold's rush to corner the world's rubber market led to a whole new form of slavery in the Congo and a reign of terror so brutal it would become the worst genocide in African history. It began with a hard leather whip called a shikot. They would use the shikot to punish a Congolese villager who hadn't met his quota. And the shikot basically flayed open the, the skin so that apparently after 20 strokes, you were a bloody pulp. 
and if you had the misfortune to have uh, 50 strokes or 100 strokes, you died. So it became synonymous with uh, Leopold's rule, and it was uh, a horrible, feared instrument of torture. But to the outside world, the Congo seemed like a perfect colony, profitable, productive, and civilized, all thanks to King Leopold. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside the Congo, things went from bad to worse. When the rubber workers inevitably collapsed from exhaustion, starvation, or disease, the force publique shot them and were ordered to cut off their hands. The force publique were issued with bullets, and the officers who were commanding these mercenaries uh, wanted to see results. So for one of these soldiers not to get punished, if he was sent out with 10 cartridges, he had to have 10 hands of his victims. It's proof that he hadn't wasted his bullets. Often, of course, some of these bullets had been wasted, so there was this extraordinary pictures you get of living Congolese who, while they were still alive, had had their hands severed. Leopold set new standards in colonial brutality. I think he did that because he just was a man in a great hurry. Uh, and he didn't think of the Congolese as human. Few statistics were collected at the time, but estimates put the total number of murdered Congolese at well over 10 million. By 1901, the Congo was one of the world's largest rubber suppliers, and King Leopold profited handsomely. He lived the high life in Belgium and in several chateaus and villas throughout Europe. Leopold never set foot in what was ironically known as the Congo Free State, and I think that made it easier for him. He could uh, not look face to face with the evidence of what he had done to that country. This big uh, propaganda uh, ploy really managed to disguise what was really happening in Africa, and King Leopold was able to get away with it. You know, He was able to kill millions, but he still pretend that he was civilizing millions. Leopold might have prolonged his terror campaign had it not been for a curious and determined clerk in a Liverpool shipping office. His name was Edmund Morell. Morell looked at the shipping manifests and discovered that while a great deal of rubber and ivory was coming from the Congo, practically nothing was going back. Uh, the main uh, items which were carried in the ships going from Antwerp to the Congo were arms and ammunition, which obviously weren't going to be supplied to the Congolese. So that struck him as extremely suspicious. Once he suspected foul play, Morel was a man possessed. He quit his job and spent the next decade investigating King Leopold's corrupt regime. Morel was extraordinarily accurate. He was very adept at reading into the sort of boring statistics how much was coming out of the Congo in terms of resources. He would get documents leaked to him by people within Leopold's administration, people who did have consciences, who were concerned at what was going on. It was a moral issue, I think, for him. There was a robbery going on on a grand scale, and he disapproved. And Morel wasn't the only one watching the Congo. A British diplomat also issued a stinging indictment of King Leopold's system of slave labor, warning it would lead to the total extinction of the Congolese people. Faced with world suspicion, Leopold defiantly proclaimed, I will not allow myself to be soiled by blood or mud, and began an ambitious counter campaign. He would bribe journalists. Uh, he would uh, bribe US senators. He would invite people to go to the Congo and would make sure that while they were in the Congo, they only saw the nicest possible aspect of what was going on. So for every step that Morel took, King Leopold was up there meeting it and trying to neutralize it. But in 1902, profound literary work added its voice to the growing chorus against Leopold. Author Joseph Conrad worked as a sea captain's apprentice on the Congo River in 1890, during the height of the rubber massacres. Conrad was so transformed by the brutality and death he witnessed that he wrote it all down, and it became the basis for his seminal work, Heart of Darkness. 
Black shapes crouched, lay, sat between the trees, leaning against the trunks, clinging to the earth in all the attitudes of pain, abandonment, and despair. He was talking about the darkness, which is at the heart of Westerners, white men who go out to places like Africa. And because they are far from their family, their friends, and the strictures of the society in which they have been brought up, they um, start behaving in ways that would have been inconceivable uh, if they were back home. They were dying slowly. It was very clear. They were not enemies. They were not criminals. They were nothing earthly now, nothing but black shadows of disease and starvation, lying confusedly in the greenish gloom. Conrad intended it to be an absolute blast aimed at the imperialist colonialist system that had been set up in the Congo and the imperialist Congolese system that was being applied across Africa at that time. By 1908, the Belgian government was forced to confront the mounting claims of an African Holocaust. To stem public outrage, it took the colony away from Leopold. The aging king was surprisingly relieved. Rubber sales had suddenly collapsed, and Leopold believed his days of fortune hunting in the Congo were over. By the time the Belgians stripped Leopold of his personal colony, his massive fortune was safely secured in a Swiss bank account. There's a common myth that once Leopold handed over the Congo to Belgium itself, that things improved enormously and it was fine and for the average Congolese living standards improved and they were treated as human beings. In fact, the difference was really not that obvious. And while rubber had become of no importance, the Belgians discovered that there was huge mineral resources under the soil. In Congo, there was uh, copper, uh, gold. So the system of forced labor went from being applied to rubber to being applied to mineral resources. <laughs> The Belgians renamed the country the Belgian Congo and ruled for the next 50 years. They boasted to the world of their help for the Congolese people and built churches, medical clinics, and elementary schools. Yes, in the Congo, other seeds have taken root. Seeds that can one day reach a full maturity. But there was a limit to how much the Congolese could achieve. Under Belgian rule, no native could vote. There was no system of higher education for blacks. And by 1956, among the 15 million people, there were just 17 college graduates. The Belgians had a motto, which was, if you keep the African ignorant and not educated, he won't present a potential problem. So they deliberately didn't encourage the Congolese to go very far in their education. It was all part of these savages are not ready to, to run themselves. It's a very patronizing approach of they need to be looked after. They're like children. They are a simple people. And to them, it's all a little strange, to say the least. They need understanding, patience, sympathy. The way Belgium was able to maintain the colonial structure during the, you know, the, the Congo Belge, during the, the Belgian Congo period, was through this colonization of the mind that the white man is a better human being than the black man. And they pump that message into the population through all forms of, of education, even in churches. And the people became sort of subdued and colonized internally in their mind. But in the late 1950s, that changed. After decades of European rule, Africans across the continent began demanding equal rights and independence. Revolts in colonial strongholds like Algeria and South Africa made the Belgians fear an uprising in their own colony. In 1960, after more than 50 years of domination and exploitation, Belgium abruptly pulled out of the Congo, leaving it a free country without a government. <laughs> 